right. Hello, Montessorians. Welcome to another live coaching call. Um, we have a wonderful guest here that is going to be talking about infants and babies. Emily Schubitz. Welcome to our call, Emily. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So you are um, a Montessori enthusiast um, and advocate. So before we dive into all the goodies that I know that you're going to share with us, can you tell us a little bit about your journey, like how you found Montessori um, and what you're up to now? I um, would love to. So I had um, always had an interest working with children and I worked in a traditional setting when I finished uh, my undergraduate degree. And it never really felt right, and I never could pinpoint what exactly it was about it until uh, my mom, who happens to be a traditional educator um, who taught third grade, had heard Molly O'Shaughnessy um, speak at St. Scholastica up in Duluth. And she got done listening to Molly, and she called me and said, Em, I think this is your gig. I think you need to check out this Montessori Training Center. Um, so I did. And I walked in and I met with Molly O'Shaughnessy and I was sold the minute I walked in um, and I signed up for the course that day. And so that was my primary course. Um, and I never really looked back. It just called to me in regards to how we honor the child individually and how we um, want to create this peaceful environment and honoring each child where they're at and how we can meet them. Um, and so I worked in a primary setting for a while and I actually had the opportunity of opening a English speaking uh, school, a program in Prague in the Czech Republic right after I did my training. And what was so fascinating to me was to be able to see that in the United States and in Europe, these programs are exactly the same and the pedagogy and the method is that strong in regards to what we want to give the children. I then, um, was asked to do the A to I training, which I did with Judy O'Ryan out in Denver. And that um, the zero to three program, I think ultimately was my calling in regards to wanting to work with families a little bit more intimately on their journey when they start having a family, if that's through adoption or having their own child. Um, and so then from there, I opened um, some parent infant programs at a couple different schools here in the Twin Cities and worked closely with the training center here with Molly O'Shaughnessy to open um, an outreach program that was ultimately going to just be a parent infant class that would work with expecting moms or families through um, 16 weeks when they could potentially start a toddler program. And what we came to realize was that the program really needed to be for the entire plane of development. So from birth to age six. So we created an outreach program that could reach some of the families in East St. Paul, which was amazing. And um, then I was got the phone call from Oak Hill Montessori to start the very first uh, NEDO um, in the state of Minnesota, which was by far in my career as of now was the biggest highlight of my life. It was a lot of work, it was a labor of love, but it ultimately, as we start talking about what a NEDO can do for your schools, it was so much more than a program and the relationships and the things that we were able to provide something as simple as just a comfort and easing anxiety, leaving your baby so that you can go to work to offering suggestions for just those common needs and struggles that new families have when they're starting to have children. Um, in this presentation, one of the biggest challenges is going to be discussed, which is the cost of running a NEDO. So unfortunately, the doors to this program had closed, and we only have one now in the state of Minnesota. But my hope is that through this conversation that I can inspire some other people to get on board and to create these environments, um, because as Montessori states, education starts at birth. And... Um, we all know that infant care is in high demand and I think that this is the most ideal way in which to do it so that it's so much more than just a daycare setting where you drop your child off and you pick up and you don't have that relationship and that connection with the educators that are with your um, youngest children. So, and then with that, I have started doing my doula training so that I can support women um, and families in that capacity at, as well. 
and I'm just gonna keep uh, hopefully planting these seeds to get these needles up and running because it's incredibly important. And um, yeah, so my hope is it'll spread like wildflower. So I'm looking forward to speaking with all of you guys about this. Yes, I love it, I love it. Thank you, Emily, for sharing yeah. your story. It's always so interesting to hear the journeys that we go through to be in the space that we're in. You know, um, especially with Montessori, I, I hear often that just it calls to who we are and, and what we want to do and giving back. Um, so thank you. And thank you for your time here, because I know that, you know, you are a busy lady. Summer has just started. <laughs> you've got kiddos running around. You've got puppies around. Um, so thank you for taking that time. Um, we've got a good group here. We've got Amy, Deanna, Emily, Jalila, and Nusrat. Um, if you guys wouldn't mind just chiming in, do you have a neato? Are you considering opening up a neato? I'd love to hear who we've got um, in that you know, process of neato environments. Um, and while you're doing that, I did just want to put, um, put that out there. Like I've, I've been fortunate enough to experience as a parent um, having my child in a neato environment. Unfortunately, it was only for a couple months because we had to move out of the state. Um, but I can't advocate enough for the beauty offered in those environments, um, especially by the trained adults um, in there. You, you go through so much training <laughs> and so much observation and just care and attention. Um, and when you're able to see it happen, the magic just happen in the room. It's just... Um, it's undescribable. I just don't have the words for it. You know, it's just beautiful. And to be a parent and being able to see that and see how my child, he was very new. He was two and a half months when he joined a neato environment. So he of course was the tiniest one there. Um, he also was the quietest because he just likes to observe. And so it was neat to see how those, those older ones who were just starting to walk were so curious about the newbies. Um, and just that dynamic of having those adults be able to respond to the needs based on movement, um, based on just everything. So I'm so excited to have you dive in here, um, Emily, and tell us all about it. We've got um, Amy who chimed in. She said she doesn't have a neato. She's always enjoyed learning and having info on topics like this. If anything, it helps with parents who are curious about doing Montessori from the start. Yep. Absolutely. Cool. So without further ado, I'm going to stop talking. Emily, I'm going to let you take over. <laughs> it's all yours. Good. All right. And I bear with me as I find my... Why is it going? Okay. So hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to start sharing some slides. And I think that one of the biggest um, points to bring, to bring to your board of trustees or... Um, for you to advocate for these programs in your school is just simply um, some of the facts that we know go into brain development with these little ones. So the fact that we know that um, our brain grows 155% in just the first year of life is a, a outstanding. I can't, you know, you can't even really put words to that. And when you think about what these little brains are doing it, um, in the beginning there. So then 100 billion neurons are formed in the first three and a half months with 83% of growth happening right after birth. And that our genes are what basically are the blueprint. They're what, um, they're what uh, help create the child and give them the opportunities and the experience and the love of learning. And so um, a lot of research has gone into understanding that a lot of the environments are what are a huge part of what creates and what um, helps support all this brain development with these little ones. Um, this next I'm slide. Sorry to pause you. Do you, do you have access to your, um, to your slideshow? Are you able to move forward and backward? Slideshow. Mine? Yep, because we only see the first one and I know that as you're talking about the facts, we have a slide on that one. Do you have that? I do and I'm, so sharing is, how do I do this? Do I hit resume share? Yes. Try that. Okay, now move. Can you move forward on it? You gonna see it? I only see the infant. Can you? Oh, no. Um, why don't you start? Because I have it up too. I can also do it if you want me to drive. Um, that may diminish my ability to look at the chat though. Are you on the tab or are you on the Zoom meeting? Um, 
And while you're checking that, Emily um, is here from Atlanta and she has a Nido community. Awesome. And she's got two toddler infant communities. Um, Emily, is that the, is that your school? You've got a Nido and um, a toddler and two toddler. Do you have primary? Um, I'd be curious to know if you do. Um, if you don't, do you have other schools that you partner with? Because I know that um, is also a consideration that people need to take um, as they, you know, look to see if they want to open up a Nido and a so I'd be curious to hear, Emily, what your situation is. And then Jalila is considering opening a Montessori school with a NEDO class. Having primary training and worked as a teacher in a three to six class for a few years, the infant adult ratio is my concern. Um, how can we make it work for the families and the business? Oh, what a good question. Um, Emily, why don't you stop sharing and then I'll um, share mine. Does that sound good? So, all right, stop share, all right. Cool. And then Emily, you have two primary classes and classrooms and one elementary. Oof, you got from the beginning and you go all the way to elementary. That's exciting. Okay, so I'm going to try to share my screen and then uh, we'll go from there. Share. All right, are you able to see my screen? I am. Okay. Okay, here we are. Let me know. Um, Emily, can you see the next one? The next yes. One? Okay, awesome. Um, are you seeing it in presenting mode or not? No. You're not, okay, sorry. Present. I won't be able to see the chat, Emily. I think you will um, because I'm presenting now. So here we are. You see it now? Yep, I see it. Okay, awesome. So I know that you mentioned um, our green, our, our brain, ugh, our brains grow 155% in just the first year of life. Um, so if you want to go ahead and tell us more goodies about the zero to three, especially in the first year. All right, let me. Can you hit the next slide? Yeah. Oh my gosh! There we go. This one. Yep. So the brain synapses. So what I was referring to the previous slide in regards to the statistics is that I think that having um, a visual is also really powerful and I'm always blown away when I look at this particular slide um, and when I talk to families about this just looking at where um, the brain is as a newborn and how many how many more firing of synapses are happening from just as a newborn to one month to nine months to two years is incredibly significant um, and so I always go back to, if we know this information and we have this research and we have these studies, why is it that we aren't putting our energy and our resources into creating these beautiful uh, environments such as a Montessori Nido? As you guys will see as we move through these other slides, the differences in them um, and creating these spaces for these little ones when they first start out. And like the previous slide had stated, there was some research done just showing that um, an infant's environment, um, at the bottom there, specialists have decades of research showing that the environment of a child's earliest years can have an effect to last a lifetime. And we're gonna end up talking a little bit, and because you guys are Montessorians, you should be, or probably are versed in the absorbent mind. And so those first three years of life are so incredibly critical in regards to what the environment looks like and what the child is absorbing because they don't have the ability to discriminate against anything that's in their space and their environment, especially the, when they're infants. Um, so I think that in itself um, needs to be discussed more and we need to get more of these open in these schools. Um, if we can move on to the next one, this is a video that I think highlights kind of what I'm saying, but it does it in a much more elegant way. A child's experiences during the earliest years of life have a lasting impact on the architecture of the developing brain. Genes provide the basic blueprint, but experiences shape the process that determines whether a child's brain will provide a strong or weak foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. During this important period of brain development, billions of brain cells called neurons send electrical signals to communicate with each other. 
These connections form circuits that become the basic foundation of brain architecture. Circuits and connections proliferate at a rapid pace and are reinforced through repeated use. Our experiences and environment dictate that circuits and connections get more use. Connections that are used more grow stronger and more permanent. Meanwhile, connections that are used less fade away through a normal process called pruning. Well-used circuits create light and fast pathways for neural signals to travel across regions of the brain. Simple circuits form first, providing the foundation for more complex circuits to build on later. Through this process, neurons form strong circuits and connections for emotions, motor skills, behavioral control, logic, language, and memory during the early critical period of development. With repeated use, these circuits become more efficient and can move areas of the brain more rapidly. While they originate in specific areas of the brain, circuits are interconnected. You can't have one type of skill without the others to support it. Like building the house, everything is connected, and what comes first forms the foundation for all that comes later. This is a great organization, by the way. If you're not um, familiar with them, they produce a ton of research um, that, you know, does go well with Montessori. <laughs> so definitely check it out if, you, if you're not familiar with them. Yeah, I highly recommend it also. And it's a really great resource for um, those of you that are asking questions about, you know, um, let me see here. Um, so curious about, you know, parents, that are wanting to do Montessori from the start. There's a really great book called Montessori from the start. Um, that's a pretty good resource and it doesn't necessarily dive into um, all the language that Montessorians are accustomed to because sometimes that can turn people off. Um, and so that, but I also, these statistics that I had posted originally are from the zero to three organization, which is another um, fantastic, website and they have current research they have um a phenomenal uh annual um course that you can attend that i actually attended and what's nice about it and i think um what helps all montessorians is to also especially with this zero to three level and these infants is not only having your own rigorous training in montessori but also being up to date on current research and things that we're learning more and more about these infants so that you are well versed in it when you're talking with families and they're asking questions or wondering why certain things are occurring with their little ones. Um, which I think leads lovely into just what is the, you know, some four or five elements of um, how we support the overall um, brain development in these new environments. And it kind of goes back to what I was just saying, like having an educated staff, um, in the state of Minnesota, you only need 24 credits in regards to working in a daycare setting or working with infants. And I think um, we're selling ourselves short in regards to what we expect and what we should be knowledgeable about when we're working with families because there's so much going on with these little ones. Um, and so having the training and then having the opportunities to dive deeper in this, I think is really important. Whereas I feel like often when you go into daycare settings, I'm not saying that there aren't really great, fantastic adults, but I'm seeing it, I think it's more of a holding and being with a child rather than doing that as well, but also being able to speak to your child's three months old and here's what is gonna start happening. Um, we talk a lot about in Monastery, the prepared adult, and it's that, it's, understanding that when we're working with these little ones, being purposeful in our movements, our language, we're not dumbing down language, that we're explaining ourselves as we're going. Um, you know, for example, when you think about toileting in a neato, they have the opportunity to sit on a low toilet and start working on those that process um, as early as six months. Um, I had a little one in my neato that was by nine months was using the toilet almost independently. And that goes into having a prepared adult that can explain the process and how to help the families if that's where they want to go with this. Um, so the prepared environment, uh, having these needles that are not full of containers and contraptions and things, but that they have the opportunity of freedom of movement 
Um, and then looking at the third bullet point, the psychosensory motor development timeline. I think that this is incredibly important when you have your NEDO environments. And I don't necessarily think that in other settings you get this conversation going, but that a little one that's not sitting upright and is in the supine position, what are some of the materials and what are some things that you can do to stimulate the child's brain development and give them a positive learning environment rather than just being in a swing with no interaction. Um, I think also what I often would talk a lot about was, you know, we talk about SIDS and going and sleeping on our backs. Um, and I had one little one that had what's called plagiocephaly, which is the flat head because of always being on their back. Um, and so being able to educate parents and talking with them about the importance of tummy time, there's just such a variety of things that can come up and it just organically can happen when you have these environments because you're allowing family members to be a part of this environment and to come in and to talk with you. You can point out observations that you're making at that time. Like, do you see that your child is about to um, write him or herself in regards to putting their arm out, meaning that they're starting to get ready for sitting up? What are some things you can do in your home? What are some things that we're doing in this environment to support your child? Um, another big part is that I think most Montessorians because we come from such a deep place of love and kindness and support is that the willingness to meet each family where he or she or them are in their journey, um, suspending that judgment. Um, I think it's really easy. And I think that's where a lot of the vulnerability comes when looking for infant programs and dropping your little ones off is so often you have people that just give you unsolicited advice or, and, I, and I'd like to think that it's coming from a place of love and really wanting to be supportive. What I found uh, running my NEDO was that the staff was trained and we had a lot of conversations about suspending judgment, meaning if a little one is showing up with a sippy cup. Now, we know that um, through research, again, that a sippy cup can actually be detrimental to the formation of an infant's mouth and how they start learning to make babbling sounds and to start speaking. Not many people know that. And I think that it goes back to having an educated staff that can kindly offer suggestions and to gently um, help support the child, which is ultimately what we're trying to do. But also letting parents know because often you just, you know what you know and you do the best with what information you have. Um, and then also understanding that I think a big part is just those parents that may hear you but aren't willing to make some of those changes that you don't always know the whole story. And it could be just, sometimes you're just in survival mode and you're gonna give your kid a sippy cup. But my point to this all is that, that you're having the conversations and that you're a safe place for these parents to ask questions and for you to gently guide these little ones. Wow. Um, we can go to the next slide. Sure, it's amazing how many, um, before I jump over there, yep. um, how many conversations I've had. You know, I've got a five-year-old and a one-year-old, um, so it's amazing how fast I forget how, you know, life is like with a 16-month-old and, and a toddler running around, but I've had a lot of conversations with parents, and the sense that I'm getting for from the younger parents, uh, meaning they have younger children, is that they're just, they're stressed out, they're overworked, they're confused on where to go, and they're really desperate for connection. Yep. Um, because this is not an easy world right now to raise your children, and nor has it ever been, but there's just a lot of unknowns that I think, um, you know, we have not seen yet. So it's, it's amazing to be able to find somebody like you, Emily, who is incredibly knowledgeable um, through facts, through data, not just assumptions, uh, but this is data driven, it's scientific based, um, but also compassionate, caring, and truly understands the whole child, not just, um, you know, milestones, because milestones are also another thing for parents where they feel stressed out. And I'll say even, even for me, like I've got a 16 month old who's babbling all day long, but is not speaking one word. And I right. bring him to the pediatrician and I go, oh, 
like, should he be talking now? And it's like, no, he's, he's on, he's within normal range, right. um, but you get pressure from all different ranges. Um, so to be able to find somebody to kind of clear the air and really lean on in this difficult parenting journey is, is such a gift. And I, to, to that point, Janine, I think what also, it's exactly that. And when you're able to create that relationship with these families and you're able to hear more of their story. And so what I often found was that um, actually listening to someone, not listening to a parent with the anticipation of answering a question, but like truly listening and letting that person potentially arrive to their own conclusions, but just needing to process it out loud often was what I would run into. But I think it's just that it's being able to have, be knowledgeable about the milestones and where potential red flags are. Um, but to be able to, again, not frighten or turn off a parent in regards to saying, you know, my 16 month old isn't doing X, Y, and Z. I know my child should be doing X, Y, and Z. And looking at, what where your child is also succeeding because often when a child is mastering one skill set other skill sets are suspended for a while and i often see parents that start to worry about okay my child is now crawling all over the place and isn't talking well that's because your little one is now working really hard on this gross motor and learning this piece and until the brain becomes more conscious at age three and the coordination, equilibrium, and everything starts coming together, you're going to see things what appear like they're falling back when really it's still very much there. They're just, there's so much, like I was saying earlier, I mean, to know that a brain develops 155% in that first year is unbelievable. So when you are able to think about all these things that are having to connect and having to make sense and having to happen, um, I often see parents go, okay, so I'm okay. And it's like, yeah, you're okay. And your little one is okay. And if we hit a red flag, we're in this together and we're going to provide materials and we're going to provide um, support to get your child where he or she needs to be. Um, and I think that's the beauty of having these needos is that their parents are invited in. We had a blue rocking chair in my needle and we ended up referring to it as the therapy chair because I don't think there was ever one parent that did not sit in that chair and at some point break down crying or just needed at the end of the day to sit down and talk to another adult or, and really like want to know about their baby's day. And we were afforded that opportunity to have those conversations. And I think that, again, when you think about a daycare, like, it, again, it's just this, like, revolving door of dropping your child off, picking your child up, knowing your child's basic needs are met. That's fantastic. But when we know that there can be something so much more, I think is huge. When I was thinking about doing this webinar, um, I think if I were to add more is just um, the input of what this program did for the families in which I was able to work with. Some of my greatest relationships have come out of working in there because of the vulnerability of being a new parent. Um, so I think that's something to keep in mind too if you're wanting to open a Nido is that to have a really great one is that it's not just a program. It's almost as though you need to be on call 24 seven when that email comes in at 10 PM because a mom is exhausted and their little one isn't sleeping. And what do I do? And I'm not saying you have to respond immediately, but when you're able to support them and they're able to trust you in that capacity, I think is just amazing. I'm a mom of three. I would have given anything to have had someone kind of on call or to help me or know that when I have to go to work tomorrow, my little one is, is being cared for, but, actually like being seen for who he or she is, um, which I can just go on and on, on about. I know, right? Ah, oh, this is so good. Yeah. Um, and Emily, I'm curious to know, I'm sorry, other Emily with an IE, um, who's attending this call. I'm curious to know if you are also experiencing that, you have a Nido community and um, two toddler communities that you get to send your lovely babies to. Um, so do you experience that same relationship with parents? And um, if you do, you know, the, the sense is that it's so unique, right? You're building this foundation with these parents at the right 
perfect time so that when they move into toddler, they're well versed, they understand, um, you know, generally the Montessori um, model of having an environment that responds to your child and a trained adult. Um, those are essential elements we want to help our parents understand. But also, you know, you're creating that commitment and that trust with a parent that will help your school throughout the programs um, thrive. So it's, um, it's key. But Ellie, I'd love to know if um, that's what you experience in yours. So, oops, I went too far. Here we go. Let's go infant environment versus daycare. Can we talk briefly about this, Emily? Um, and I know you do such a good job of like not um, judging, but can we, <laughs> let's look at this a little bit and see how you know, the difference between daycare and environment goes. Well, and I think, and I appreciate that comment. Um, I think what I'm about to share here is not so much judgment, it's just truly facts. And so some of these pictures that you're going to see, um, I think speak for themselves, but I wanna walk through a little bit here. So with an infant, um, if you have a neato um, in your community, I highly recommend um, observing and going and seeing it because you're going to see such a different setting than you would if you were to go to an infant daycare program in regards to the fact that um, a neato is going to look more home-like um, and is going to have, again, that prepared adult on the ground, um, not in adult chairs unless they're, you know, giving a bottle or something, but really in it with these little ones rather than what I've observed when I've gone to daycare programs, where it's more set up to watch and entertain the child with um, bright lights and all these toys that make noises and aren't necessarily purposeful. Whereas in a neato, you're going to see like actual like instruments that make the proper sound rather than some of these plastic gadgets that start lighting up and spinning around. And again, when you look at the research, when a little one is put in front of screens or some of these products, what actually happens is that their brain actually is suspended and there isn't any development occurring because they're overstimulated in a way that is actually not supporting the optimal piece and in which you want the brain to be actually developing. And again, remember what I said earlier of how quickly and rapidly these little brains um, mature and learn and everything that's going. So really being purposeful about the things that you are giving your little ones and what this environment looks like. Because as we all know, the majority of us um, are working. And so your little one is in a program for potentially 40 to 50 hours a week. So I, I think you need to ask yourself, what exactly do you want for this little one? Do you want them sitting in a swing half the day? Do you want them to be around all of these things? Or would you rather have this peaceful educational setting that really sets the foundation for further learning? Um, which goes into the freedom of movement. You're not going to see walkers. You're not going to see containers. You're not going to see um, bumbo chairs, things like that, that actually have adverse effects on their development. Um, if you were to, and I have a picture that's going to be coming up of some little ones sitting in a bumbo chair. Some of you may not be familiar with. Keep going. Look at all your beautiful environment pictures. Okay. Next one. Next one. Sorry. So looking at your screen on the right, you see two little ones sitting in what is referred to as a bumbo chair. If you Google those, you are going to see physical therapists basically on fire about how potentially horrible these can be for little ones because their body isn't, their spine isn't myelinated, which means the fatty sheath that goes around your neurons haven't, um, hasn't completed and so they actually are being forced in a position that is actually not natural and their body isn't ready for. Um, that's not to say if you have one that you've completely ruined your child. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying though is it's an unnecessary product and it's not helping the child in any capacity. Sure. Um, as a new parent, you know, if you come across this picture, they look happy, they look content. Right. Um, so, and, yeah. and also we have a society where media, social media, and uh, you walk through Target, you walk through a baby store, and you see all of these products, and they are catered, and they are marketed 
beautifully to make a parent feel like I need this. This is going to help my child. Um, and I think that the beauty of a neato is being able to speak to parents because let's face it, these little ones cost a lot of money and infant care is extremely expensive. So I think what's nice is to be able to speak with parents and say, you know, you actually don't, I would recommend that you don't use this for X, Y, and Z. And also you're going to use it potentially for like two months rather than um, putting your finances towards something that they're going to have for a much longer period of time. Like you see in the toddler environments, um, the little wooden chairs that these little ones can start practicing with and don't necessarily need to be in these bumbo chairs. Um, on the other side, you see these little ones that are in, uh, these swing like chairs. Um, and I often would speak to um, other schools that were looking to open a neato. And when you look at that picture, imagine sitting on the floor. And as you can see, these adults are up in adult chairs and their vision and everything is looking down on these little ones. Not to mention that there's a bottle propped in one of the baby's mouths. And depending on your state, this actually in the state of Minnesota, um, is a huge infraction and could get your program shut down because it can be a choking situation. Um, and then again, as a Montessori, you ask yourself, if this little one can hold a bottle, they probably can sit up and they can um, maneuver a real glass in which to drink from. So why create another transition from something when you can just eliminate some of these things? Um, but sitting on the floor and imagine putting yourself in those little ones perspective how would that feel having all those cribs and the, the, it, I don't know, like when I look at that, I just think it just makes me so sad because I see nothing warm about that. Not to mention that these little ones, their eyesight, if you look at the um, cutouts that are up, up on the wall, these little ones are probably four months old, maybe five months old. Their eyesight vision, they can't even make they can't even really see those figures on the wall and decipher what they are. So again, I think it goes back to the education and knowing that what a baby can see when that eye development is occurring so that the products and the things that you have in these environments are actually stimulating in an appropriate way and aren't there for the sake of the adult. Um, Janine, if you could go back. So this is another, again, often what you'll see in an infant daycare setting is um, everything is done to the child. Um, I always found it interesting that you would feed all these little ones in a container such as that. Um, the one where the game or the toy is on. You know, as Montessorians, we always talk about um, any material you have in your environment has a purpose and that things are orderly. And especially with these little ones, their sense of order is so huge and their points of reference. So, to me, that little one, first of all, is way too young to be sitting in a chair. Their body isn't ready to be like that and to be hanging that way. Um, but what is that, what is that area of the environment for? Is it for eating? Is it for playing? What, what exactly is that? And to me, if that's your eating space and you keep it as your eating space so that the little one is starting to develop and understand that when, oh, when I come over to this area, I can now predict what the next step is going to be and I'm actually going to get a meal rather than, okay, I'm not really sure. Now I'm super confused. Am I going to play here? Am I going to eat? Um, again, you're trying to help construct their brain so that they can categorize things and that they have these points of reference to help ease a lot of anxiety and a lot of just learning because that's what we do in society, right? We categorize things. When you see a dining room table, you probably, the first thing you think of is meals, probably not toys. Um, and again, it goes back to the things that you see on the wall. That little one can't see, nor is that appropriate educational material on the wall. It, to me, it looks like it's counting. Um, that's such an math is such an abstract concept and the fact that there's pictures on the wall um wanting to provide that education they need it to be tangible and they need to be able to hold it and to have it in their hands so again it's it's knowing you know what you know and i think that as a montessorian who's been blessed to do this training you realize that man these things are just not they're not 
helping in the capacity that we think that they are. Um, you know, the word um, empowered comes to mind here because as you work with these parents, and I'm going to go back to our slide, um, you work with these parents and you help them understand how to make a choice, you know, because I think um, an educated choice, a knowledgeable choice about what you're going to bring into your home, because that's what we do in our environment. So we're modeling it for our families. Um, so that when they go into Target or they go into a play date even, and they see these things that seemingly address a child's need, it gets their child excited, it gets their child like eating, because sometimes that can be a big challenge. Um, we, we help empower them to make those choices based on knowledge, um, understanding, and the child's developmental needs at the time. So it's empowering them, you know, to be able to do that. And that is what our parents need. They really, really need that ability to go out there and do that for our children. Um, well, because you're walking around really vulnerable, like I said, and you're walking through these department stores and these baby stores and you're asking yourself, I want what's right. I, I've got to believe every parent out there, even those that we question because of whatever their parenting um, style is that may appear to be abusive or not. I think, again, it goes back to you only know what you know and where you're coming from. And so we all, I truly believe at the core, want what's best for our children, our little ones. Mm -hmm. And so I always just get so sad when I walk through these stores and you can just see the look or feel the energy of these new parents thinking, oh my gosh, I need to get this and I need to have this and I need to have that and I need to, and it's, my concern is that you start to lose the sense of just being present with your little ones because you're working so hard to give them the best start. And sometimes the best start, um, in my opinion, isn't all these things. It's just being with your little one. Um, I think what's also fantastic about these needles is that we're environmentally friendly. So using cloth diapers and talking to parents with that, I had probably a handful of parents that were just didn't want to do the cloth diaper at home, which I completely understand. Um, it's additional work when you're working all day. The last thing you want to do is do another load of laundry. You want to spend time with your little one. What I think and I would recommend for those of you that are considering doing this is that if there is a diaper service in your community, um, being able to let parents know that that service is available. I think also what is starting to become a new trend is at baby showers is actually having somebody, um, having those that are gonna attend it contribute money for a diaper service for the first year so that you can environmentally, you're supporting the environment, should, which we all, if we're paying attention are aware that we really need to get on board with this and getting rid of all our plastic and unnecessarily uh, materials that are not helping our environment. Um, but being able to say to a new family, like you can literally, cause you are going to go through so many diapers. And what's so fantastic about these services is that you don't have to deal with a thing. You literally can just change your child and put it in a container and they take it away. They sanitize it. They bring it back. There's none of this having to wring out a cloth diaper. There's none of this additional work that at least for myself, when back 42 years ago um, when my mom had cloth diapers. Like that was a huge process she used to share with me and having to hang them up outside to dry and so that the sun could bleach them and things like that. I think um, we need to really tap into our communities and see what services are available to help support these families. And again, keeping the environment in mind. Um, you know, speaking to a bunch of Montessorians, the same thing happens in Anito. It's about the individual. It's not about group learning. So we never put all the little ones in some of those contraptions that I showed you to do like a language lesson. Because in the first uh, zero to three, we still do, um, for those of you that might be more familiar with primary, the three period of lesson, I think was always interesting when I would share that with um, these new parents is that you actually can do the first two lessons of a three period lesson, naming the object, the game of hiding it, putting it somewhere, having a little one crawl away, put it somewhere and do, fetch it. Um, we don't do the testing period in the first three years of life just because they're unconscious and we don't want to uh, redirect a little one into a 
space in their mind feeling like they aren't successful and that they can't re recall these things. Um, and so I think that's a really important piece to these needos is that we're really tapping into where each little one's at in their development and being able to provide those materials. And then again, being able to share with parents, you know, you can work on this language. Like you were sharing, Deneen, you know, being concerned about your little one who's not necessarily, you know, potentially speaking or things like that. And it's just babbling and why aren't words forming? It's like, now I can say, oh, there's this really cool thing that you can do with your little one and with your older child can actually do too. And sharing the, the two periods of a three period lesson, mm -hmm. um, I found was always super popular with the parents. And it was like, oh, I had no idea. Well, again, we only know what we know. Um, and so when you're able to share those little tidbits and create another connection with these families is so beautiful, I think, because we have these electronics and these iPads and things that these little ones are starting to be exposed to. And so my concern is that there's not this like actual bonding and connection that's happening, the humanness of it all. So when you're able to provide information, like you can actually play like a really fun game with your little one and, and you, your little one isn't even realizing that they're actually learning something that, um, which I think is just great. Um, the other thing that I think sets the needle apart from a daycare is that um, the scheduling that again, it goes back to if, when that child is tired, they get to sleep. When that child's hungry, they can eat. When they need to have um, their diaper changed, they get to have their diaper changed. Um, it's not this set regiment schedule of, okay, nap time's at noon. So all the little ones need to be programmed to go down at noon. With that said, when I have talked with people that um, run these infant programs um, and they say, but it's just so much easier because, and they all end up adapting to that schedule. And yeah, absolutely. They're going to adapt to it because they're going to shut down at some point um, and realize that I'm not going to be able to sleep now. I'm going to have to wait until whenever, when all my other little friends are going to go down to sleep. Um, and so you start already at that young age constructing what something as important as sleep is um, for these little ones rather than really following the child and letting them have that, especially in that first year of life, um, the opportunities to go at their own pace and what those needs are. Um, and I always found it interesting when I would ask the adults, why exactly do you do it this way? Is it about the child or is it more about the adults? And hands down, it was always, it's so much easier for the adults to set their programs up like this. And I can't advocate enough that I don't think we're doing any justice with these little ones. When we put our adult expectations on them and create programs that are easier for the adults rather than what's best for the child because nothing worthwhile comes easy and this work isn't easy at all. Um, but it's incredibly rewarding when you're able to see that you've completely, you've done to your best of ability to honor that little one and where that little one is. Um, so Emily, and, you mm -hmm. have been doing a fantastic job of convincing us <laughs> that needles are absolutely, um, you know, essential to your program. Um, and also, you know, the things that you've been teaching us, it, it helps us hone in on the details. So when we do open up a needle, or if you're, you know, looking at maybe structuring your language a little different or highlighting particular parts of your program, look at this information and see if you can pull some things out to really be able to communicate clearly why your community is so much, um, is so different from what anyone else offers in your, you know, in your area, um, because this is where it really hits home for parents. And I think, you know, had I I'll take my Montessori out, I've never, I've never been trained, which is hard because I was trained 10 years ago. So it's really in me. Um, but if I was a parent to walk into an environment that is free of clutter, is um, purposeful, the adult to child ratio is um, very clear, and there's not all these gadgets, um, it would be such a breath of fresh air to be able to walk in there. I would love to have my child just there, loved and doing what, what he or she needs to do. 
Um, so Emily, can we, just for the sake of time, I wanna make sure that we, we get into the logistics of it because I know many of our participants wanna know, how do you make this work? Like how this, yes, Emily, we totally get it. We wanna do this. We know families want it, families keep asking us, but I can't figure out how to do it with logistics. Right. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, I'm gonna move to that slide, although I know there are some pictures in between. Sure. Yep, and will the participants be able to access this slide deck? Yeah, well, I can make it available. Um, um, due to time, I can talk about this for hours and hours. Um, I think that some of the um, pictures, if we can go back just a minute so I can touch base on again. Keep going. Keep going. So I think like we don't need to watch this video, but what I think is so huge about it, and I recommend if we can share it out to participants, because I think if you can show um, families, your head of school, whomever it is, things that happen in Anito, such as this, this is a little one that's learning how to walk up and down a staircase. Um, and I always think it's so fascinating because if you have the opportunity to watch it, which I highly recommend, there's a part in the video where, um, I can appreciate a parent or an adult wanting to jump in right away, thinking that this little one is gonna fall down the stairs. And in my experience of working in these programs is that their ability to coordinate once they use this particular material is absolutely amazes me and how he, this is his work. This isn't just like playing on the stairs. It's, you can see that his little mind is trying to figure out how far can I go? When should I stand up? How do I get my feet down? these staircases. And again, when you look at a daycare, you often see the plastic like foam rolled on um, almost like a mound. And I can appreciate that. Sure, that looks super fun. But again, it's not helping a little one actually learn a skill set that they're going to have to learn. We're going to have to learn how to maneuver staircases. And if we can do this with these little ones in such a beautiful, fun setting. Um, the other piece to these staircase also, um, is I don't think I've ever seen a child do it where I haven't started to cry because you literally see the joy and the success and the pride in these little ones' faces. I'm getting emotional even just thinking about it. I've never, every single little one that I had the joy of working with always, hands down, would just beam up and their face would light up and they would start clapping. And then their little friends literally would start clapping. And that told me that the empathy was starting at that age and that there was this community that was being built that these little ones couldn't vocalize it and probably didn't know how to, they can't express the emotions, which is where as the prepared adult, you're giving it that language saying, you're so proud of your friend or you should be so proud of yourself. Um, it's just simply amazing. So I highly recommend at some point, Janine, that um, if you can share this out to anyone that's interested, it's, um, it's, it's quite lovely. So we can fast forward so we can get to the nitty gritties of everything. This is just another pictures of the Nido, how we have a small toilet. Um, this happens to be my littlest one, my Violet. That's what I um, another, oh, she looks yeah. <laughs> purposeful materials right there. Um, you don't see the little guy um, sitting in any contraption or container. You can see his toes are curled over because he's working so hard to sit up and to work on that. Um, we also um, take them outside, let them explore, feel the grass. It's, I highly recommend it. It's hysterical. Half the time they don't want to put their feet down or their hands because it feels weird. And again, you're giving the language of like, oh, is that prickly? Or um, it's just, yeah, it's just such a beautiful way to spend your day with these little ones. Another needle that's, um, I believe this one's out in California. Um, Floor beds are, this is another video that I recommend you guys watching at some point. You can Google it. It's a, um, one of the needles that's in Japan um, and it's quite lovely. And again, that staircase is a huge material. Um, also, what I think is really important to discuss with your um, heads of school or if you're thinking of creating this yourself is if we can go to the slide with, go back to the one where my little olive is holding a little, right here. So another huge piece to this that um, I think Oak Hill appreciated so much um, was that, so we talk about the four planes of development, right? So the first plane and the third plane parallel, the second and fourth 
parallel. This school happens to have a junior high. And what was absolutely amazing about it was that these infants who are going through so much change and trying to figure out where they fit in and what the heck's going on, these junior high kids are also going through a huge change of puberty and what is going on. And I feel like I'm learning a concept, but it's not really making sense to me. Why do I need to learn this? Um, so what spoke to the community, I know, was that these junior high kids, when they just needed a break and they needed to just like recenter themselves, they came into the needle and they, we were able to show them how to hold a baby, how to give a baby a bottle to talk with them. So there was an education occurring, not only just in the needle, but with the outside community in the school for those junior high kids to learn something. And they'd ask questions of us. The children's house, this is um, a children's house child who happens to be mine, um, Olive, who's holding a baby. Um, she just was, she had worked really hard in that three hour work cycle and just wanted some downtime and they were afforded the opportunity to come in and they could hold the babies. Often this was a really great way to support your children's house community because you were able to have those early um, readers could come in and they'd just read those Bob books. If you're not familiar, those great resource are the Bob books, but they would come in and they'd read to these babies and it wasn't as intimidating as being in their children's house trying to read with their peer group. Not to say that that doesn't happen because it absolutely does. I just found in my experience, it was a really great way to create this community in the school was kind of having that open door policy um, of letting these kids that maybe just needed a different outlet in which to also work on their education was with these little ones too. I think which is a huge selling point to a lot of schools. Um, Deneen, if we can go to the next slide, I think there's... Um, we do have one question, um, Jalila. Yeah. She's, she's asking if NIDO is the entire zero to three span or Perfect. is it part of it and followed by a toddler environment? Um, that's absolutely a perfect question. I can see why you'd be potentially confused by the way I'm talking. <laughs> um, because the zero to three training is just that from birth to age three. A NEDO is eight weeks. Some states will um, allow six week old babies to come up till 14, 15 months when they're able to walk well, then they would move into a toddler program. So a NEDO is just a uh, infant's toddler is 16 months to two and a half, three years. What is also confusing if you go and you start researching this online is that often AMI refers to the toddler program as an infant community when really it's not. So the verbiage can be a little confusing with that. So I hope that makes sense that the NEDO is not the entire year span, but to have a NEDO be successful, I don't, you need to have a toddler environment because then these children are able to transition into that toddler program. Because if you get little ones that are six months old, they're only gonna probably be with you for six to seven months and are gonna need a space in which their needs are, you know, are they will have exhausted everything in the needle and they need to move up to a toddler environment. Um, which is also great, kind of like what I was talking about with this particular school where the needle was in. We had the needle, then we had two toddler programs children's house, lower, upper elementary, and junior high. So it was a fairly large school. Um, something to keep in mind is that when we had the NEDO, uh, we only had one toddler program. And what we quickly realized was, again, the demand and the need for these infant programs. And when parents walked in and saw the infant, the NEDO versus everything else they had toured, hands down, they were like, oh my gosh, I had no idea that this is a possibility or I can have this for my little one. And if you have them the toddler programs, it just eases the transition and the driving and your, ch your child, it helps create that foundation to your school, which if you wanna talk business-wise, is a really great way to have a healthy enrollment because if you can get them in the door as an infant, they're probably most likely gonna stay. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. Yeah, you actually just talked about this, but Emily, um, how many toddler communities do you recommend per NEDO community? Two. So I would do a neato and two toddlers. Um, and keeping in mind, which we're gonna start talking about here too, um, which I'll be able to explain to Deneen with that question is um, knowing 
your school community. I think that one of the biggest pieces, um, selling points of having a NEDO is that if you have a community with young staff that you know are going to have children, it's a way, I think that most of us as Montessorians want to return to work and we want to be doing this um, and our heartstrings get pulled because of just that trying to find a daycare that's close or trying to find care that's close to your work and finding some someone that you trust. Um, what was really amazing about having a needle in the school is that we had um, some young, younger people. So half of the students, the little ones that I had in the beginning were actually staff babies. And what was so great about that is that we were really supporting these teachers to come back to work. They were able to have the opportunity to come in and feed and bond with their little ones. Um, and that eased a lot of anxiety for them and the guilt. Because I think as parents, we have guilt if we work, we have guilt if we don't work. We have guilt if we work part-time, We there's just a lot that goes with it. And having talked with um, staff, that was a huge piece was that they could really focus on doing what they needed to do at school and to teach, knowing that their little one was right there. And um, advocates for your school. Like right. For sure. Um, so if we could briefly go through, you know, let's say we've got, um, I've got this idea, I want to open up a NEDO. Um, either I don't have a school already, or um, we have a community and we want, we're thinking about opening up. So what, talk to us a little bit about beginning your journey. Um, so a big part is knowing your community where your schools are located and um, do you have a lot of young families? Is this a need that your community needs? Um, even in suburbs, some suburbs are gonna be populated with older uh, families that aren't necessarily gonna need this. So it's important to be able to do a survey or to get that data so that you know if this really is a need. I'm um, talking with your board of trustees and I think that's huge often for these schools that have a board. Um, there's the financial piece and there's the convincing of why we should have these in our schools. Um, so meeting with a board and being able to go through a lot of what I've just been sharing with you guys, um, just about the brain development, how we can support our staff. I think that's the biggest one is selling point is to say, we value our staff. We wanna have a healthy enrollment. How can we do this? And if we wanna talk business, probably more times than not, when, a, when you see that a teacher has been, that the turnover rate is super low and the teachers have been there for a long period of time. I know that when I put my parent hat on, that's a huge selling point. That tells me that these teachers are happy in their school. They love what they're doing and they're supported in, in their work life family balance. Um, so I think being able to just say, you know, we value our teachers. We want them to come back. We want them to have a family. We want to support that. We need to have these programs in the school um, was an easy sell for Oak Hill. Um, again, surveying the school, how many of the families that you currently have um, that are thinking of adding more children to their family or how would they feel about having this program um, was a huge piece. I don't think we ever received any there was never anything negative about it. If anything, it was just the excitement of the community being thinking, yes, we can support these teachers and we can get them back in the classroom and they want to be back in the classroom and still with their little ones. Um, being able to talk to your school about if you, there's far and few between A to I trained people, um, the zero to three Montessori. Um, we're trying to get more and more people to be trained, but it, um, not it's hard to do because most of the trainings are during the summer um anyways with that being said it's also really expensive and so being able to talk to your board and to your head of school or you yourself if you're thinking about it can you create in your budget the scholarships to be able to sponsor your staff to be able to go um, and get this training so that you can um, have these programs um finding an architect being aware of the codes that are in your state um Codes change even from county to county, which I found, which was incredibly interesting to me. Um, some are gonna require that you have handicap accessible bathrooms. Um, now are these little ones gonna be in a, in a wheelchair at this age? No, but it's a law and so we had to accommodate that. So it was really eye-opening in regards to all of that. So being, making sure that you are aware of that because I would hate for anybody to start creating these environments and then 
realize, oh, we didn't do it the right way right from the start. Meeting with contractors, I recommend three bids. Um, and really being able to speak to what you're envisioning. Often what I found was that the contractors that I was working with were only familiar with daycare. So they were questioning, why would you want a little toilet in here? And why, where, they just constantly, like, I'm confused. Why do you want a heated floor? Why do you want wooden floors? Like, why aren't we putting cheap carpet in? So you really have to be able to speak to what you want these environments to look, look like with them. Um, licensing can be a nightmare depending on which state you're in. I just have realized that in Wisconsin, apparently they don't have as many strict laws and they may, um, a school reached out to me that wants to open a Nido and they may be able to have floor beds. Uh, in Minnesota, we can't have floor beds. And when I met with even a state representative that came to tour the Nido program so that we could start working on changing the law um, and meeting with DHS and licensing, it always fell back on it's too much work to change the law. We're going to keep it as is. So my hope is that for any of you out there that are hoping to do this is that you start advocating and um, fighting for some of these things to change because if history didn't change itself, look where, I mean, can you imagine where we would be? Um, you're going to need a public health nurse um, and then just the paperwork, hand, handbooks and waivers and things like that, that, um, there's just, it's a lot of work and I'm so happy to share any of it having done all of it. <laughs> There's no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, and I think one, and then the one big thing that I think um, some of you are probably saying, well, why aren't, why aren't more of these happening? Why did yours close? What do we do? Um, is the cost. Hands down, you're going to hear it's too expensive to run a needle program. And having done it, I truly believe it does not have to be as expensive as they are. I think you can be really creative in finding grants and setting up scholarships and your tuition and your fees. I think you need to be able to look at what you're setting your tuition as at, for infant uh, tuition. And because it's going to be projected when you have your toddler program, children's house, or however big your school is. Um, and that, again, is a big piece to, um, again, depending on what your community looks like. Um, I see a question that just- yeah, There's a couple, Emily, if you wouldn't mind. Um, if, if you're thinking about you know, surveying your community and your staff, I imagine that um, many schools start with maybe a parent-infant class which then, you know, gets new parents into the door and allows, you know, your staff or even yourself, if you're the head of school doing this, to be able to connect and also assess where people are at if there truly is a need. So do you have any events that you offer to new parents that aren't enrolled um, in your school outside of an open house? Um, yes, so parent infant uh, is a huge, um, piece to all of this, even if you end up not doing a neato, if you can find a space where you can do parent infant classes. Um, at one of the schools that I taught at, that was a big way of getting families in the door and ending up enrolling into their toddler program. Um, so I think at a minimum, being able to offer parent infant classes where you can touch on everything that I've just kind of shared. Um, my suggestion, again, is depending on your community, you might want to set up a sliding scale um, so that families can afford to, to do these programs. What I would recommend is an eight or eight week sessions that would meet once a week. Um, I tried doing them on the weekends and often those were not attended very well because it's time to be with your family. Um, so early mornings, so being able to uh, figure that piece out. Um, it's doable to do in a school that doesn't have um, a separate classroom to do parent infant. I started a program where we were doing it in the lunchroom. And it doesn't have to necessarily always be beautiful. It's just getting the information out there and going from there. Um, Emily, do programs like that exist? So like, let's say I'm, you know, wanting to do a parent infant class. I'm not well-trained, but I'm knowledgeable about it. Are there programs available that you can implement in a parent-infant class, or is it usually you're creating what you need? Can you 
explain? So like I imagine it would be really helpful to have, you know, an eight week program set out that on this week we talk about, it's a like content schedule. This week we're going to talk about movement and this week we'll talk about feeding and this week we'll talk about developmental, um, you know, appropriateness of things. And so just having, is, is something like that available out there or would you, could you recommend any resources? Um, that's a fantastic question that usually is asked of me. Um, you can basically when you're starting a parent infant program, there's really nothing out there that's going to give you a structure or how you would create it in your school. Um, at least that I have yet to find in my research of having um, starting parent infant class. So I started the first one in 2006. So it's been a while um, and I've yet to see anything out there. One of my uh, colleagues, Sarah Mudry, she's another research that I would recommend. She has um, a website, Studio June. Um, she offers parent infant classes and both her and I spoke at NAMTA on this and had that conversation that really you have your own autonomy in regards to how you want to set up your program. I know that some of the Montessori schools do set up um, topics week by week um, and that sometimes can work. What I have found to be most beneficial is Having figured out a bunch of topics, feeding, sleeping, uh, challenges with nursing, uh, navigating a household with multiple children, a whole gamut of um, topics and having printouts and having things available in videos. But what I found to be the most beneficial when I did my programs was that we all came together and we always started the conversation with that we're all here. This is a safe place. We are to suspend judgment because we are here and there are going to probably be some really hard questions that need to be asked. And we need to be kind to one another with where we're at in this journey. And it just organically would happen. One mom, I would just say, how are you doing? And one parent would say, I'm really struggling with X, Y, and Z. And then we would just go from there. And then what was beautiful is that these other parents were able to chime in with like, well, this worked for me or this didn't work for me. And it just was really, um, I found it to be in the communities that I started these programs, it to be better that way, the autonomy of your community in those classes and meeting those families again where they're at because some families are not in a space. I don't need to talk about uh, sleep schedules. I'm losing my mind because my child won't eat a vegetable. And so I found that it was just easier. And I think that the reason we had such a high um, enrollment for the programs was just that the parents knew that each week that they came, even if we weren't able to address that question that week, I was aware of it and I made note and there was always a handout available and then I could do follow up, but they knew that their voice was going to be heard at each class. And I think that that's something you have to really think about when you start these parent programs is that um, I know that I think ECFE, early childhood family education classes often go week by week by topic. Um, and again, I think you just need to know your community. And my concern is that you may have a parent in there that really needs a need met or an answer to a question and they're feeling like they can't speak up because this week we're not talking about that. And I would hate to feel like a parent is present already, took the courage to get up, get out the door, come to a class and feel like they're not being judged is huge enough. And to, for me to feel like that parent is dying to ask something and can't, um, wasn't for me, I felt like I wasn't gonna be, I wasn't going to be of any use, if that makes sense, Deneen. Um, yeah, no, that's beautiful. Um, so what I imagine it being is just this space where people can connect with each other um, and really share resources, because as parents, especially if you're in the newbie stage where you're like so tired and like you just need adult interaction, um, that alone is motivation to go. But, you know, having a handout that you can always refer back to later when you need it um, is helpful, but just that connection. So that's perfect. Um, so we've got a little bit of time left. If you wouldn't mind speaking to the fears that we hear so often about opening up a NEDO um, and, and what we can do about those fears. So the biggest one, I think, or I know, it's always the cost. Um, and I see, Amy, you asked, 
Yep, Amy's got to go. Um, but Amy, thank you for joining us for sure. Someone that was asking about the fees. Oh, yeah, yeah. Jalila did. Um, the fees and structure and salaries. Yep. And I, again, um, it, what my program looked like isn't going to necessarily be relevant to you guys and where your schools are and your communities. And so it really has to be about where your community is and the socioeconomic status of those communities um, and where you can set your fees. Um, and so what I would encourage you to do and what I did is that I looked at um, where my school was and then I looked at other infant programs and spoke with them and found out their, ski, their fee schedule and what they offered under it. Did they offer meals? Did they offer a diaper service? Did they, what were the hours? Did they um, add on additional costs to aftercare, before care, things like that? And so you really need to do the research in your own community to find out what the, um, the mean of that cost is and then go from there. And I would always recommend that you do add a little bit more to a needle because then you're going to sell it in regards to the education of your staff, the training, um, and what you have to offer. And once you have that environment set up, you're able to show pictures, it's going to sell itself. So there was never a point. Um, having a needle, you are always going to have, it is always going to be full. It just there's such a need for infant care that that is not ever going to be the problem. You are going to be waitlisted. Um, I was waitlisted. I knew people were pregnant before they told their spouses that they were pregnant so they could get on the list. Um, the biggest fear is the cost. And I think that you can be really creative with your budget and ask yourselves, do we, what do we value most? And if we value the education of our children and we want to create a strong, solid foundation starting at our youngest, um, with these six week old and eight week olds, I think when you're able to crunch the numbers and see that we're going to put a lot of cost up front for the foundation of the school and in return, trusting that process, because once you have that and once those families are in and they see that the transition from a neato to a toddler, from a toddler to a children's house is almost seamless because they've had the experience of seeing all those children. There's not the anxiety of, oh my gosh, I'm stepping into this other environment. You're slowly, gradually creating a larger community of eight infants to now you're with 12 toddlers to now you're with 25 children's house. Um, and so you really have to just look at what the cost of infant care in your area is. Um, something to keep in mind is the ratio that we recommend is one to three and not one to four. So it can get tricky in regards to how do you staff a neato and pay them a livable wage. But again, I think that more work can be done in looking into grants um, and looking into your personal community and seeing what I know for me personally, what it did for a lot of the families that I worked with who actually, when the doors closed and as devastating as it was due to cost, what, where the board of trustees fell short was that they didn't hear the voices of the parents and what the program did for them and that they wanted to set up a scholarship. They wanted to set up a fund so that they could make this affordable and that the teachers would stay. Um, and I think it takes a lot of advocate. You have to advocate for it. And I think once you build it and they come, you realize quickly how successful it can be. I think we're still in a society though, unfortunately, that doesn't value infant care in the way that we should. And I think the more schools that are willing to take that risk and jump on board, um, you're just gonna realize how beneficial it, it really truly is. Um, right. Money's money, it's a hard one. It's really the, the only thing that makes it a struggle is um, sustaining these programs. But I, I believe in my heart that you can be really creative when you look at budgets and you start asking yourself, do we need to have X, Y, and Z? Can we tap into our community? Do we have a family that is willing to build some shelves for our classroom? Do we have to always fall back on Neon House or um, Alice in Montessori or all these other services? Yes, it's easier, but maybe we need to start stepping back and really looking at our community and giving our parents um, and families the opportunity to, to say, I have this skill set and I am happy to sh share it pro bono. I am happy to volunteer my time 
if this means cutting costs so that we can support all these programs. Um, and I think we forget about that. I think we forget that we can give that voice and that opportunity to, for parents to say, I want this and this is what I'm, this is what I can do to make it happen. Right. And, you know, from a business standpoint, um, while it may not be, you might break even, right, in this right. program, um, thinking about the benefits that it's going to give, not just the babies and the families that are currently in the environment, but the programs after. And, and I can't say enough how valuable it is to have parents that truly know who you are, they trust you already, um, they, they want to give so much because they, because you give them so much. Right. To have parents and families <clears throat> like that in your community as a guide, um, that's huge. If you, you know, I was an elementary guide for eight years and it's, it was like when I had parents that just got it and knew it, we could hit straight to the point of what it is that we were talking about, which was their child. You know, like, let's discuss your child versus me explaining to them the Montessori philosophy and what I do in my classroom and why I have this particular thing in my classroom. They already had that. So right. I could really focus my energy on the child, um, which is why we're all here in the first place. You know, right. let's, let's get rid of the, the other stuff. So um, from a business standpoint, while it may not, you may break even, you are investing in your programs for years to come. So keep that in mind too. Um, Emily, I'm gonna to move to the next slide if that's okay. And then we'll probably have to wrap up here. Um, let me see, we do have, Emily said we had a good success with getting parents who joined us at the toddler and primary level, put their second child in the neato environment. So you've already got families that go in there. Um, that's awesome, that's really good. So did you get that question, Emily? Or at least comment? Uh, the recommendation for space. Um, oh, wow, we have more than that. No, no, no. Um, no, Emily from Atlanta, she said, we have good success with getting parents who joined us at the toddler or primary level, and then they joined the neato environment um, on that. And Emily, I'm curious, do you give preference to families that are already enrolled so you hold that spot for those families? Because um, I imagine you're probably pretty booked. Second child, I mean. And then what is the Montessori recommendation for space per child, I believe? Yeah, space per child. Um, super great question. I, um, another resource for you guys to consider, and um, Janine, if you're willing to share out, is my NAMTA article, because that also goes into depth um, a, little, a lot more, and it has an actual um, what paperwork is needed, um, and eating um, everything that you would need to create a needle, because there's no reason that any of you need to recreate this wheel. Um, so in regards to AMI, they recommend 35 square feet per child, okay. per infant. Okay. So something, I think that's a, thank you for asking that question because the other piece that I wasn't going to mention but is really important what I realized is my needle had eight infants, three adults, and we were in a space of 650 square feet. And it was too small, in my opinion, especially when those little ones started walking um, and couldn't move up. And so my recommendation for needle space is actually 800 square feet as, um, at a minimum. Mm -hmm. Good. Good to know. Um, I know we've kind of dove into this a little bit with just, you know, when you're starting your journey, um, facilities, licensing, staffing, connection to community and trust. Um, is there anything that you want to highlight in those that we haven't touched on or anything else you want to explain? No, I think I pretty much covered it. Mm -hmm. um, again, not being familiar with like Atlanta and some of these other um, areas, I think the, the, the best step to move forward is to have the conversation with your head of school and your board of trustees, and then looking into your state and the um, licensing requirements and what you're going to need and what those costs are. Um, mm -hmm. Sure. And I think too, Emily, having a team, like don't feel like you have to do this all on your own. Um, 
isn't it amazing how when you talk about this and because there's such a big need, how many people come when you, you know, like you can gather so many people because they are, um, they hear how passionate you are and they want to help you. Um, and so, you know, find your board members, find um, your current families, find your friends that, that want to help support you make that or help you to make this work for sure. Um, there's another really great question someone asked. Um, yes. Oh, uh, another thing to, that we did that I think is really important is that if you have um, a neato, if you have a little one that's in your neato and they then move up to toddler, um, being able to project the enrollment piece so that you can hold space in your toddler program for that little one to be able to move up. And then we always gave priority to families that were already enrolled in the school if they had a baby, which is why I had to share with them that they needed to tell me sooner than later, pretty much the minute they found out they were pregnant so that we could get them on the list so that we could hold that space. So again, being able to support your current families um, in doing that. Right. It sounds like Emily is doing the, a similar thing as well. Um, it's, it's amazing how, you know, your planning goes when you find out you're pregnant. It's like, okay, I've got to like put these things in place. So definitely making sure that you let your child care know that that's going to happen. Um, um, all right. So I know, you know, this is obviously sprinkled throughout our conversation, um, you know, what Anito can do for your community. But I wanted to pause Emily and see if you had any last thoughts about um, you know, that piece, um, and then also just, just anything in general with Nito, because we're firstly so thankful to have you. Your knowledge is um, indescribable. You are so passionate about what you do, and, and Montessori is definitely fortunate to have you in our community. Um, in closing, I think I could talk about this all day. Um, Moving forward, anybody that is present on this webinar or hears about it um, can always reach me uh, through email. I'm always happy to support. I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. I'm happy to, I have talked to other boards about it. I have been present at other schools for parents to ask questions. Um, I believe in this work so much that um, I want to be able to provide that to anyone who wants wants that. Um, I see that someone's asking about a list of resources. So again, Deneen, if you can um, send out, I have the NAMTA article, sorry, there's a bug flying around me, um, that really uh, touches base on everything you need to do to get one going. Um, and the two websites that I recommend, also the zero to three is a really great resource. And then the Harvard Education, which is the video that we showed in the beginning. Um, but I think this conversation is going to be so different for each of you, depending on where you're at in this journey or what you're hoping to have for your community. So I just want everybody to know that I'm happy to meet you where you're at in your in this process. If it's, I just want to talk more about it, um, or I've got the board, uh, you know, has approved it, what would you do as next steps? And in this slide deck, it shows what next steps would be. But, you know, again, just... I'm happy to help support, like, would you meet with an architect first or would you have contractors come out? Like things like that, um, the nitty gritty pieces to it because some of you may have a space in your school and I'm happy to look at what that space looks like and to say, this is what I would do or this is what worked great in our environment. This is what I would have done differently um, having lived in the space, the things that I would have changed. Um, and I think that's really individually based on everybody and where they're at in their journey. And so I just don't want anyone to feel like this is all they get. Like, I'm so happy to sh um, meet anybody where they're at in this journey so we can get these programs up and running. Yeah. Well, Emily, you might be traveling more than you think. Soon. <laughs> <laughs> I love a good, I love a good road trip. <laughs> right? Especially in the winter. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> out of here. All right, Emily, well, thank you again for your time. Um, I will make sure to post um, you know, the resources that Emily had mentioned. Um, we weren't able to go live on Facebook, but I'll make sure to post those in Facebook and then I'll email them out as well. Um, so thank you all for our live attendees who were able to join and chime in. Um, I know Jalila had a couple more comments. Um, Jalila, we'll stay on after and just, um, you know, respond to those, but we really appreciate all of you here. 
Um, please do join us. We do this every week, 10.30 a.m. Pacific Time, 1.30 Eastern Time. Next week, we're actually having Yvonne on. He is our Google guru um, alongside John. So if you've got questions about Google, we'll tell you all about it. He's going to be talking specifically about Google Smart Ads, which I know a lot of our members do. Um, and he's going to tell you the do's and don'ts with that because you can spend a lot of money in Google and you don't want to do that. You want to obviously, um, you know, the limited funds that we all have to make sure that we use, we're using them in the best way possible. So um, again, Emily, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, you guys. All right. Take care, everyone.